Well, it's certainly no secret to any of you that during the 2016 primary season that I was an enthusiastic supporter of the candidacy of Bernie Sanders. I was not taken with him because I believe that he was a political savior who just happened to comb his hair with a balloon, <laughs> but because he was a person who clearly articulated uh, an advocacy for rapid change to renewable energy, for making higher education tuition free, for raising the minimum wage, lowering military spending, reining in the excesses of Wall Street and protecting our environment. Now, Republicans derided him as being crazy. They just dismissed him as being a socialist. Traditional Democrats said that he was impractical. And the pro-banking media said that he literally lived in a fantasy land, that his economic ideas were ridiculous. However, the famous French economist, Thomas Piketty, heartily endorsed him and his economic plan as did many other leading economists around the world. Noam Chomsky, the world's leading uh, uh, political philosopher, also endorsed Bernie Sanders. And true to Noam Chomsky's style, he, uh, he added that voting for Bernie Sanders might be the last opportunity that our generation will have to save the modern world. And so you might reasonably ask if I am now grouping myself with the likes of Piketty and Chomsky, and I would say quickly that that's ridiculous, although if the shoe fits. <laughs> so what's going on here? The world's leading experts in the field are applauding the economic revolution proposed by Bernie Sanders while both political parties and the corporate geniuses of the world and virtually all of the media agreed to be entirely dismissive of him. Well, honestly, it's not that one side is right and the other side is wrong. It depends on your assumptions. If you assume, as the Republicans and Democrats do, as Wall Street bankers do, as the corporate media does, if you assume that the constant accumulation of wealth at the top of the ladder is something that cannot be challenged. If that has to happen, if wealth has to keep going to the top, then Bernie's program is pure fantasy. If, however, you are willing to challenge the current trend of redistribution of all wealth to the top, then it really isn't even hard to envision an implementation of the economic plan that he articulated. The complaint is that there's not enough money. There's not enough to pay for the fantasies of free education and having sufficient housing and nutrition and health care. And when the government wants to talk about the federal budget, they show us a pie chart like this, in which the two biggest parts are Medicare and Social Security. So if you think that the federal budget is 60% taken up by Medicare and Social Security before you spend another dollar, then it's easy to fall into the political hand-wringing of how can we afford to do this, how can we afford to do any of the things that progressives talk about. Well, of course, what Sanders and Piketty and Chomsky and, and I hope you know is that Medicare and Social Security pay for themselves. And even universal health care, if we went to, as Bernie proposed, a Medicare for all, that it would pay for itself. We would simply, I would stop paying uh, Humana that has my health insurance, and I would pay the government the same amount of money or less, that we would have universal health care with less out-of-pocket expenses and have more availability of it. This is not hard. In fact, it's easy peasy if you can get your head around the fact that insurance companies do not have a God-given right to get into your wallet to take their profits. If you can see beyond the fact that health insurance companies don't even have to exist and don't exist in most of the developed world, then it isn't hard to get to universal health care. So the pie chart that includes entitlements is really just a way of tricking you into accepting the status quo. If you look at the remaining portion of the budget, 
the the actual discretionary spending, you see an entirely different situation in which military spending comprises more than half of every dollar spent. And, and even that, as a percentage of the budget, is, is not entirely accurate because like veterans benefits uh, is military spending. You don't, uh, veterans aren't created out of, uh, out of uh, uh, clear air. You have to have a war, you have to have a military to create veterans. So all of that is in the military budget. We are now spending a larger percentage of our budget on military spending than we spent during World War II. That since 9-11, the percentage of discretionary spending in the military budget has gone up and up and up to the highest point in our history. So when you look at all of that taken together, military spending gets to be the biggest elephant in the room. Now I'm no Mahatma Gandhi. I'm, I'm aware that we live in a dangerous world and that our military means more to the world's stability than just us defending our shores. I get that. But we could make public colleges tuition free for about 5% of the military budget. 5%. And, and if you think you can't find 5% of waste, fraud, and abuse in the military budget of nearly a trillion dollars a year, then you just don't understand military spending. And in fact, the people who say that it can't be done are the ones who are crazy, impractical, and living in fantasy land. It not only can be done, it would be easy. Now, we took our wisdom lesson today from this man, Brigadier General Smedley Butler, and Butler is interesting in several ways, not the least of which, uh, as Mark mentioned, he actually put down a fascist plot to overthrow the American government. It, it's something that did not appear in my American history books, but during the years of Franklin Delano Roosevelt and the New Deal, there were a group of corporate oligarchs who were afraid they were going to lose power if uh, his redistribution of wealth went through because their power was based on their wealth and they didn't want to lose the status of being super wealthy in an impoverished country. And so they, they recruited him to lead a military coup against the government. And there'd been a, a promise to give a, a bonus to veterans of World War I that the government didn't pay, and there'd been uh, a big protest. In fact, uh, the National Guard was called out and they shot several veterans uh, during that protest. All, all of this was news to me. One of our listeners suggested this book to me, and this is a part of American history that did not show up in my classrooms in Glasgow, Kentucky. But Butler actually listened to these guys, got to know enough of who was involved and what was going on to be able to then go to Congress and shut down this plot to uh, overthrow the government. And oddly enough, even though the fascist plot was put down, no one was arrested, no one was charged, no one was tried. Men and women, the rich, are rarely held responsible for their crimes. But my interest in this man is from this very slim volume that Butler wrote in the 1930s, uh, so slim that it's more of an article than a book, but, but a book that deserves to be read again in our age. Told in the authentic voice of one of our history's most decorated soldiers, Butler describes even his service in World War I with these words. He says, I was a high-class muscle man for big business, for Wall Street and the bankers. In short, I was a racketeer for capitalism. That is, he was aware that even in World War I, we were using our military to support the profits of our corporations and our acquisition of, acts of, of resources. And that the, he, as a brigadier general, was little more than the muscle for the mob. Now, a lot of the aspects of World War I required a military response. But as, as Butler points out in his book, at the end of World War I, there were 21,000 new millionaires and billionaires in America that had not been that wealthy before the war. War profiteering has always been the real reason for any war. It's who gets rich in the process. Military spending is the fastest way to move large amounts of money from the whole of the population into the pockets of a tiny fraction of the country. 
And in many cases, they don't even have to have anything to show for it. Reagan's Star Wars initiative was a sham from the start. There was no science behind it. There was no physicist that was saying that you could build a laser that would shoot missiles out of space. There was no science behind it at all. But there was a lot of spending, an awful lot of spending. Nearly $200 billion were paid to defense contractors who really were expected to do nothing but look busy. You are going to give you all this money, make it look like you're researching this when we already know what the answer is. They never produced a product. They never accomplished anything. It was just your money became their money and the program was over. And if we had longer, we could go on to lots of examples of military bases that are still open today that were built for use in World War II. Weapon systems that literally go from the manufacturer's floor to the scrap piles. And that's without even mentioning the fact that we keep building ships and airplanes when modern wars will not be fought with ships and airplanes. Modern offensive weapons just make aircraft carriers a great big slow moving target. There are in the world right now 19 operating aircraft carriers, 19. We have 10 of them. China only has two. They got a lot of coastline. Russia has one. Great Britain, which even after all these years is still completely surrounded by water all the way around. Two generations ago, Great Britain had 40 aircraft carriers. Now they don't have any because they're useless. They cannot be used. But who asked us to just build another one? Our Clementine Caligula steps up to the plate once again <laughs> and wants to build our 11th aircraft carrier. But trust me, men and women, you do not want your sons and daughters serving on an aircraft carrier because if there was ever a shooting war, it would be the first thing to hit the sand at the bottom of the ocean. We keep trying to negotiate our way into peace accords. We form defense alliances. We use trading agreements to forge lasting, peaceful partners. Now I have my own ideas about what would create world peace. Uh, I think that if we put money behind clean water programs, uh, education programs, and micro business initiatives, that that would create the circumstances for a peaceful world. The Turkish have a, a proverb that says, a hungry man is an angry man. And, and I think diffusing what leads to wars would be uh, alleviating the suffering of poverty and ignorance. <clears throat> but even though I can Photoshop a picture of myself in between Thomas Piketty and Noam Chomsky, uh, I really don't have any more credentials in this particular field than to say that I slept in a Holiday Inn Express last night. But General Butler actually published a plan to stop all unnecessary wars and useless military spending, acknowledging, I mean, he's a Brigadier General, he acknowledges you got to have an army and sometimes you got to use it. But when a government goes to war, Butler suggested that we take all the profit out of it, that nobody should get rich out of a war. His plan was pretty dramatic. He said that one month before going to war, the government must literally draft all of the executives and employees in the military industrial complex, that you subscript them into military service, and that you would pay them and all politicians in Congress and the Senate, as well as all generals and colonels and majors, pay them exactly the same salary as the soldier in the trenches Amen. as long as the war lasted. So that nobody makes any money and everybody takes the same salary as the guy who's risking his life. Now the truth of modern warfare is that we send the children of the poor from one country to go and kill the children of the poor of another country. There are noble and patriotic exceptions to that, but by and large, the Trump family didn't serve in uniform, nor do any of the members of their private clubs. War is a racket that is designed to enrich the few and only the poor pay with their lives and the loss of limbs and poor health. Amen. It's always been true, but it is probably more true now than it was during General Butler's lifetime. So as his life was coming to its close, he was watching 
the military buildup all around the world, the armies being uh, grown in, in Italy and in France and in Germany. And the truth is that no country has ever raised a huge army and built armament that they never used. That's the thing, that as long as you've got it, it is going to be used. And he saw another war coming. So he proposed an amendment to the Constitution, a peace amendment. And the amendment would have made it illegal for American troops to be deployed outside of the Americas or for any ship to stray farther from our shores, or any airplane. Airplanes could go 500 miles from shore and ships could go 300 miles from shore, but no farther, unless we were dispatching them on a mission of mercy. Now that may sound entirely impractical to say that we would put in our constitution that we couldn't send armies abroad and we couldn't send our ships uh, to other nations or our airplanes. But you know, at the end of World War II, we made Germany and Japan draft constitutions that say exactly that. And they have observed that and the world didn't fall apart as a result. Now, I think Butler was a Republican, but I think he would have been a good friend to Bernie Sanders. I think they would have understood each other. Financial and natural resources are limited, and we can't do everything that we can imagine. But we can redirect our use of natural and financial resources to create a world that is sufficiently stable to make military action so impractical that it would virtually never happen. And if we haven't learned anything else from our wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, Surely they have taught us that there is no way to win a conventional war in our era. You can defeat an army, but you cannot defeat an ideology. You can build better technology, but you cannot engineer peace. And clearly we cannot expect the people that are getting rich off of military manufacturing to police their own excesses. They never will. And we cannot expect leadership out of politicians whose elections are financed by the military industrial complex. That will never happen. I know that talking about the end of war in our time sounds far-fetched and idealistic and therefore it is unlikely. I know that. But what I'm telling you that it is not only achievable, it isn't even complicated. It isn't even hard. It would be easy to accomplish if we had campaign finance reform, and that's a topic for another day, but we can end all wars by changing how we spend our federal budget. And here's the good news. You're the federal government. Amen. Thank you for watching our videos. We are entirely dependent on the donations of our listeners and members. We hope that you find this content to be important enough to help us to keep offering these videos to the public at no charge by becoming a regular contributor. Please click on the donate button on our website at www.spfccc.org. Thank you for your support of progressive religious programming.